I've been sitting behind a computer screen giving this talk for the last, you know, two years, so forgive me if I'm, like, disjointed in actually being in front of people for the first time. So, um, uh, we have a handout today, which we thought would be good rather than a presentation, so I'm just going to be referring to the slides as we talk. Um, so, I'm going to start with, you know, why do we need Link 21? And I think... Um, uh, well, I'll give you a little background. Uh, Director Allen did a really great job of identifying sort of the difference between BART and inner city passenger rail capital <coughs> corridor. There's also a number of other trains throughout the region. We have actually a, a lot, a fair amount of, um, of uh, you know, transit and train network. But um, one of the problems is it's it's not really uh, connected or timed, and it's fairly disjointed. So um, you know, it doesn't really compete then with the with the car when you're ta talking about options of traveling within the uh, mega region. So when we talk about the mega region, we're talking about the 21 counties mega region. So, um, you know, service goes on Capitol Corridor, goes all the way up from Auburn down to San Jose, as you know, um, where it um, will meet with Caltrain and there, and there are already some connections with BART. But, you know, we, um, those connections aren't customer facing, they're not really timed, and, and those types of things prevent people from riding them. Riding them. Um, you know, the mega region that I refer to, we didn't make it up, it already functions as an economy, a mega regional economy. It's actually the fifth largest mega regional economy in the country. Um, and one of the things is, I think, you know, we all experience it, some of the um, jobs housing, there's a jobs housing imbalance, there's lack of affordable housing, which, you know, um, causes people to already live and work in places that are far away. That's, you know, what has caused our super commuters. And you can see, actually, even though uh, BART uh, and Capital Quarter, our ridership isn't quite back up to what it was pre-pandemic, pre the roads are, you know, the roads are still congested. So we see that people are traveling back. They're just, um, they're using their cars. And so, you know, California has one of the, has very aggressive greenhouse gas reduction goals. And so getting people to choose to take um, uh, transit is one of the key ways in which we're trying to achieve those goals as a state. Okay, I and then also, I'm looking at my notes, forgive me. Um, you know, pre-pandemic BART, I don't know if anyone was a sort of daily rider, but it was at con it was you know at capacity. The trains get through the Embarcadero area were just um, you know we we were really struggling to make sure that you know we could we could have a safe environment for passengers because there were so many passengers. And so um, providing for that future capa or those capacity needs and also creating redundancy for BART. Um, I think today we had a disruption and the trans base service was cut off. And so one of the things that this program is aimed at doing by creating a new uh, passenger rail crossing of the bay, it does provide that redundancy, right? So there, it will be interconnected with, um, if we're focusing on having a more connected system and we have two crossings, you know, that allows us to have that redundancy. Um, it also, you know, gives us a, a, um, a reliability and it also, you know, would potentially um, allow us to run different hours of service, because I don't know if any of you are staying up past, you know, midnight, I'm not, but, um, you know, BART, it is um, often cited for, you know, not having service, 24-hour um, service, which I think um, one of the things we saw in the pandemic was a lot of our transit-dependent riders really need service um, outside of that nine-to-five window. And so that's another what some that's another goal that we would be hoping to achieve. I'm jumping ahead, but so the next so the description of Link 21 is you know it's it's a passenger rail crossing of the bay that is, is aimed at interconnecting this transit and um, inner city and passenger rail. You know there's a number of uh, rail and transit projects that are already happening in the region, and we're partnering with them um, to make sure that um, you know so that with the goal of Link 21 sort of being what brings a lot of those uh, different projects to, together. So I'm referring to things like Deardon Station or the improvements of uh, high-speed rail and Caltrain um, into the Salesforce Transit Center, um, those types of things. 
Um, and again, with this goal of creating a more sort of integrated network, right, that, um, that's connecting new markets, has hours of service, better frequency. So I'm going to talk now about our goals and objectives. Um, we do have a, pr a process with our project and sort of how we are moving forward and, and making decisions at certain times. And so uh, in the spring of this past year, um, the, our boards adopted the goals and objectives that you see here. Um, you know, you know, I'll note that transforming the passenger experience is sort of off to the left. Um, and that's because, you know, without really achieving that goal, we can't really achieve the other goals, which are promoting equity and livability, supporting economic um, opportunity and global competitiveness, competitiveness and advancing environmental stewardship. So this is really getting at the fact that, like, we need to transform the, transform the passenger experience. We need to, you know, attract riders. We need to understand where they want to go, what kind of service that they want. You know, and that's that's fundamental for us to be able to achieve the other goals that we're setting out with the program. So I am going to go. Oh, did I skip? Oh my gosh, it's double sided. Excuse me. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> so a couple. Of, I'm going to go to this one here with the geographies. Um, I apologize for skipping all over the place. I'm happy to take questions at the end. You know, uh, this this is just shows that um, compared to other regions, large economic centers, um, you know, we actually have a pretty limited uh, distance that you can go within an hour of a commute. And so this is comparing, you know, San Francisco to New York and Chicago and Washington. And so I think, you know, we have to remember that you know, if people are traveling by train to their to their jobs, there is a limit to the amount of time that we're willing to, you know, do those commutes. And we want to make sure with this project that we can sort of expand that bubble. So down here, I'm talking about <clears throat> the projected growth. So, you know, one of the things we have looked at is, you know, how is our mega region going to grow? And I think that's also, that's a question that we need to answer, especially post COVID. Um, and we are working on some like really solid modeling to answer that question. But we did do some market analysis at a high level um, at the beginning because, and we were able to sort of like uh, build the uncertainties of COVID into those. And what we did find was, you know, that the population growth is still projected to, our region is expected to grow um, to over 15 million. And when we look at where that growth is and where those tra where the travel demands are, it's interesting because you, you can see here what we found was like 26% of that of those new of new trips would happen in the inner core, the nine county Bay Area. But then 64% of those new trips are actually the uh, are projected to be those people that are traveling intercounty from you know sort of the out, outer edges of the region into the core. And so I think that's really key because it really shows that there is still this need for the interconnected sort of mega regional service. Okay, apologies. I will be aware that this is double-sided. I did ask for one-sided, I think, so. It's not Henry though, it's me. Okay, so back to our goals and objectives. Sorry, am I all over the place? No, you're fine, don't worry about it. Camille and I do a really good, like. Just say the slide number. Yes, I'm sorry, slide number seven. Apologies. So equity is something that we really, sorry, am I on the right slide? Have I caught up? Yes. yes. Seven, thank you. Um, equity, you know, um, you'll notice that equity is really interwoven into our uh, goals and objectives. It's important to note that large infrastructure projects uh, like, like transit, highways, they have had sort of a disparate negative impact on marginalized communities. Okay. Um, and they often have also not really looked at serving um, all, all, all needs. And I think especially, like I said, post COVID, we do see, um, especially during COVID, that we have some really transit dependent riders. And we wanna make sure that we are offering them like what the service that they need. And so one of the ways in which we're addressing equity is um, I'll talk about our business case, which is really how we're like evaluating concepts as we develop them. But we're looking at and making sure that those concepts are, um, you know, providing for providing benefits 
to um, you know all and particularly um, places that have been underserved or previously marginalized. Um, so we're doing, we, equity is interwoven into sort of our evaluation process and how we're developing concepts. Um, it's also just one thing of, is, and this is actually just a good thing to note for overall project delivery. We are doing a fair amount of engagement and outreach now at the planning stage. And you know, um, it's really important to uh, have people understand what you're trying to do um, and listen to them throughout the process. I think that, um, you know, I recently read a, a report from the Eno Foundation which talks about, you know, infrastructure delivery. And one of the things that they note that's really key to keeping sort of projects on track and um, on schedule and on budget is actually having um, consistent, you know, pre-planning level uh, community engagement is really important to uh, keeping projects on track so they don't go haywire at the end when all of a sudden you're like hey I'm gonna put a train track next to your house and then you know how that turns out and so you know we are trying to be really open and transparent about the work that we're doing so that people understand and and it's very um, it's one method of, of project delivery that sort of keeps us on time and on track with it when we're getting to the future Whew, that was my spiel. I'm gonna, um, I'll be back, but I'm gonna now, Camille's gonna start on slide eight here at the bottom.